Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, CyberSight. And I'm Dr. Miller here at the Cleveland Eye and Laser Surgery Center in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm with Retina Associates of Cleveland, and we're already in a case because we're running over a little bit. We have a presentation today for you. The next patient is a dislocated IOL with um, removal of the IOL and suturing, scleral fixation of an IOL, which I plan on doing by Acrios. All the calculations and everything are done. But we are running over here a little bit. Uh, this morning, first case was um, a recurrent RD with PBR. And we did that one, and then this gentleman was waiting too, and he's a diabetic with a, with severe uh, neovascularization of the disc and dense vitreous hemorrhage. We just pulled all that off, and you can see the disc here is bleeding a little bit, not much. Um, he did have a vast and preoperatively a couple weeks back, and that's helped out quite a bit to contract the neovascularization. You can see the significant peripheral ischemia out here. And I will just make comments about this case. You see me lasering kind of close to the macula perhaps, but look at these vessels, they're completely white. This is you know, non-viable retina anyhow, it's ischemic and we're better off just lasering it off. It'll probably help long-term with diabetic macular edema, also prevent anterior segment neovascularization. The patient already had pretty good PRP in place. So you're seeing a lot of old pigmented scars too. We're gonna stop there. Wrap this up, bring me down to normal pressures, Mike. We had the pressure up quite a bit, um, headed at 60 during that lasering because there was some bleeding in the eye once we pulled off all the mass of the elevator pressure for the couple of minutes while I was doing the PRP seemed to have slowed down the bleeding and we're in pretty good shape. So we got a nice clear view. No significant brisk bleeding, and we're going to wrap it up. So what we're going to do here is, while we're getting him patched up and the room turned over, I'm going to get a point one two there. Let me just show him this. I'm going to pull this out, by the way, and we may not get to see this later. So you can see right here where that wound was at. If you press, these wounds are angled. If you press on the top of that wound, not in the wound, but on the top, it kind of collapses that tunnel. I'll try and show you over here. This cannula went in on an angle, you know, like this. So if you can imagine, there's a, you can just see the wound right there. So I'm gonna go just posterior to that, just inferior to that, go over the roof of the wound and collapse it. I pressed pretty hard enough to make a little bruise on the sclera there. And we're good on the pressure, right? Here we're down, same here. So we pull out the infusion cannula, and here again, here's the wound right here. So I don't press on the wound, but I press on top of the wound. The wound is angulated and just press and you collapse that. And that is it. There's no leaks on these wounds. This is a 25 gauge sutureless vitrectomy and we're set here. So welcome again, everyone. This is Cleveland Eye and Laser. Um, we have a team of people on here, including uh, Mike Carson from uh, Retina Associates and our fellow Dr. Shuley is with me too. So we will uh, walk our way through a little lecture presentation and that will take maybe 10 minutes. The room will turn over about by that time. The title of my presentation here is, uh, there it goes, IOL dislocation and replacement. So the causes of IOL dislocation, and I, and I did read through a lot of the questions I got ahead of time. Um, this is one of the questions, what's the cause? Well, surgical complication of cataract surgery, ocular trauma, pseudoexfoliation syndrome, zonular dehiscence, broken scleral sutures from a prior IOL, um, and prior vitrectomy surgery. And um, what we're seeing a lot is my own patients coming back and patients of the other surgeons in the group who have had a prior vitrectomy for retinal detachment repair most often. And it seems like with the advent of Protectomy surgery being used primarily for retinal detachment repair over scleral buckles. We're getting more zonular dehiscence and lysis. People are scleral repressing, shaving the vitreous base, working on peripheral PVR. So especially patients who've had two or three vitrectomies to repair retinal detachment, we're seeing dislocation five, 10 years later. And I'm sure it's related to the zonular uh, uh, dehiscence in those cases of multiple parts plane uh, wounds being created. 
Symptoms of IOL dislocation is a sudden change in vision, loss of vision, uh, hinged IOL. You know, sometimes the lens implant is um, only dislocated from 270 degrees and the lens implant will kind of hinge up and down. Uh, so if they're sitting upright, they can see and they lay down, their vision goes out. They also can get glares, halos, and diplopia from a partial dislocation. So your surgical approaches here are, you know, one is do nothing. If it's immobile, you know, there's certainly no retinal damage. These lens implants are so feather light, I can't think of a single case where I've seen damage to the retina from a lens implant in the posterior segment. So if you're in a location where it's just frankly impossible to retrieve the lens, it's just economically or technologically um, not possible, or, you know, the skills aren't there, you know, you can leave a lens implant in the eye if it's not moving around, it may not even bother the patient at all. And then you can go with an eighth acre contact lens, you know, spectacles, thick glasses, or you can even consider placing a secondary IOL without removing the original. I've seen this done a few times, even here, uh, where a surgeon will go back and place an AC IOL and leaving the dislocated PC IOL in the back of the eye. So the anterior segment in a more rural area, maybe just leaves the lens where it, it is in the vitreous base, inferior and they come in and slide a lens implant right into the um, anterior chamber and position it like they would in a cataract surgery. Other approaches for surgical approach would be a repositioning in the sulcus. You assess the anterior capsule support, assess the zonules. You got seven, eight clock hours of support. It's very likely that a nice three-piece lens will sit well in there. It cannot be the single piece lenses. It has to be a lens with the overall diameter between the haptics being the large numbers, whether it's 12 or 13, I, I don't recall. I think actually my second case today may be a candidate for that. So we actually have two patients lined up. The first one has a dislocated IOL that's in acrios that dislocated uh, in the eye, not previously sutured, it was in the bag. And the second one is... Um, a lens implant, it looks like there may be enough capsule support to remove the single piece lens and replace it with a three piece, perhaps. We'll check. And if there's time for, for you guys to hang out for both cases. So the surgical approach is pretty straightforward. We do a removal of the dislocated IOL through an anterior wound near the limbus. I tend to go uh, superior because I'm sitting superior as a retinal surgeon. Um, we make that wound right into the clear cornea. Uh, the advantage in that is you're well above the iris. Uh, iris prolapse is very uh, difficult to deal with in these more complicated cases when you're in and out of the eye a lot. So really want to avoid iris prolapse. And the simplest way is to make a more anterior wound uh, into the clear cornea. We make larger wounds around six millimeters for solid lenses like PMMA. Uh, some of these lens implants are 15, 20, 25 years old. And that was the most common lens implant of the time back in that era, or sometimes we use a smaller wound, quite most often we can bisect the lens in the eye and take it out uh, in halves or as a Pac-Man technique. Either way, we can take it out through a smaller wound and then we can insert the acrios also through that smaller wound. So the replacement choices, uh, we could place an anterior chamber interocular lens Factors include things like age, corneal condition, anatomy, and glaucoma. Uh, the patient's now in the room, actually, uh, and so the team's prepping the patient now and getting the block done for me. We can also do a surgical approach, um, iris fixation of many model IOLs. So that's sewing the iris, sewing the uh, lens to the iris. Um, I'm not... Uh, I, I don't do that procedure myself. It's more of a the cataract surgeons in the area do that some. I'm not as big a fan of that. I've had to take a few out for different surgeons because of chronic inflammation or recurrent hyphemas. So they develop a version of the of the UG syndrome, uveitis, glaucoma, and hyphema. And it's from the sutures eroding through the iris. They're proline sutures or nylon sutures, and they're just kind of chewing on the iris as the iris flexes over time, causing recurrent bleeding or inflammation. So not my favorite way to fix an IOL. Uh, spiral fixation without suture, three-piece lens. Um, common name for this is, uh, is, is, the, is the Yamani procedure. I have a partner who does a beautiful Yamani procedure, Dr. Hall, but I do not. That, uh, I don't have a real preference between 
like telling you which procedure to do between acrials, cortex, suture fixation, which I'm going to do today, versus a Yamani procedure. I can tell you that they are quite a bit different and the skills you develop to do each one are different. So I've been doing the acrios for quite a few years now and I've gotten very comfortable. I've watched Dr. Hall and others do the Yamani and I've been very impressed with the uh, elegance of it, but there's certainly a learning curve when you watch those cases in terms of distorting those haptics and getting them in the right location. The one advantage of um, scleral fixation without suture is you're not worried about the suture breaking. So here's a little video showing uh, them making those sclerotomy locations, tunneling a sclerotomy location, picking up a lens that's already in the eye, right? And explaining the haptics. And you can see using forceps of manipulation, you can drive those haptics just through the scleral wounds. You can cauterize the tips there a little bit to uh, make them more bulbous so they don't feed, go backwards and um, suture things up. You can see that lens implants nicely secure. That was the one already in the eye. And you end up with a subconjunctival blue proline haptic there, right? You see the, uh, as you can see on the screen right here, there's a nice example of a slit lamp photograph many weeks after surgery. A little blow up view there. Again, this is the haptic. There's some risk of that, that eroding in the eye, but if you do this procedure with uh, a little more modern technique, this is an old video of mine, actually. Um, you can actually get that haptic to be more intrascleral and less risk of erosion. So the surgical approach I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to put my mask up just because we're opening the case and we want to keep things you know, clean in the room. So... The surgical approach we're going to talk about today is scleral fixation. I use the Acrios AO60. Uh, in the past, I have used a CZ70BD. That type of lens, single piece PMMA, has a real large um, optic on it, which can be nice in certain cases, and it has little eyelets for the uh, sutures. The problem with this lens is um, it's only two point fixation, so the lens can tilt, you know? Also, the sutures that go through here. In the past, have been proline, and there's a roughness to these eyelets where that proline will eventually break. I've never uh, seen it go much beyond 10 years. Usually, they break between 5 and 10, and then the lens is hinged and falling down again. So I kind of abandoned that technique in favor of the Gore-Tex lens, which has four-point fixation, which we're going to show you today. And we use it with a Gore-Tex suture, which is a non-resorbable suture, monofilament, very strong tensile strength. It's also thicker. We don't need the needle. It says CV8 on it, but we don't really use the needle in most cases, rarely. And I've never had one of those break. And you can see the Gore-Tex. It's actually very tough to pick up on the subconjunctival space here. It's right here. Um, very difficult to pick up. Once it heals in, it's kind of sclera colored. There's one on each side, about four millimeters apart where it enters the eye. Interestingly, I've done a case more recently where we had to go back and release an IOL like that, that had a pacified patient had a subsequent retinal detachment later, years later, the gas bubble pacified the acrios that was sewn in, went back to cut it out. And those sutures are so tight in the sclera, like the suture didn't even need to be knotted anymore at that point. The sclera kind of grabs the Gore-Tex. So advantages to the Gore-Tex, you can insert through small incisions. You can um, minimize the risk of IOL tilt because you have four-point fixation. Um, avoidance of iris contact, so you're not rubbing against the iris with anything. And the strength of the Gore-Tex. And here's how the lens implants kind of threaded with the Gore-Tex. I'll show you this during the case. One suture on each side. And different ways you can do four-point fixation. I'll be more using diagram B where we tend to just use the working sclerotomies here, and then I'll make extra incisions, extra sclerotomies here and here, and I'll put the infusion cannula down in fair temporal farther. But you can move those incisions. So depending on what's going on in the eye, scar down conjunctiva, uh, glaucoma implants or shunts, blebs, you can move the incision sites to make, the, make it work. So I'm going to... Let's see how long this video is. Um, 
we're going to show you here. Now, here again, you're seeing the uh, lens implant in the eye, make a corneal incision. Again, kind of high in the cornea, a little over three millimeters. You see me kind of carve that open a little bit on the corners. And we're going to grasp that forcep with a forcep or the retractor itself, actually. That's a single piece um, Acrosoft type lens. We're going to bisect that grab it, bisect it, pull it out through the wound. So I'm going to be showing you all this ideally live today here in just a few moments. They're getting it ready. That comes out. Um, there's the acrios. This is obviously a very edited surgical video. So things look very simple and quick, but you'll see in the surgery, this is a much more nuanced procedure. It's a handshake technique to pass the suture off from one to the other, grasp it, externalize the, the suture. We're going to fold the lens. And what I do here, by the way, is I pre-place the, um, the two lower uh, uh, Gore-Tex sutures. And then I put the last two in after we get the lens in the eyes. So now we got the lens in the eye and we pull up on those inferior sutures. You can see the spaghetti effect in there. That can be a bit of a mess. We're going to avoid that today kind of the technique, again, there's a learning curve and you, you learn how to avoid some of the problems um, early in the case. And here we see uh, us externalizing the sutures and the haptics will uh, center up real nicely. I'm gonna jump ahead here um, and not get too much into these for right now. Uh, and we'll take questions in between. So post-operatively, et cetera, we'll come back to that. We're ready to start the case. So we'll jump to our live surgery. You collapse that down for me, and uh, I'll see you over at the microscope camera. So assisting me today is Christine as our circulating nurse, and Janine is also assisting us, which is a rare treat as our administrator. Doesn't come into the room quite as often as she did in the old days. And we get Don, who is our expert business office manager, who is also our videographer. Can we drop the bed a little bit? So. I like the bed to be on our machines, uh, just as a point to everyone. Keep coming down right about there. I like the eye to not be any higher than the drip chamber on the bottle. What I've realized if it's higher than that, uh, the eye can soften up. The retractor, you know, the eye pressure versus the retracting the pull power doesn't match up. And there we go. So there's the eye. I think we got a video running, right? You can see the lens implant there, kind of sitting. Um, the profile of it sitting on edge. We're looking at the haptic right here. Take the Westcott scissors. Dr. Shuley is assisting me here as our very brilliant young fellow in retinal surgery after completing his residency in, uh, in uh, Kansas. Now, Dr. Shuley has actually done a few of these cases for me already as a primary surgeon. And uh, maybe we'll come back someday in the future and watch him do a case here on CyberSight with my instruction, but today I'm gonna be the primary surgeon. And there we go. So I'm just cutting down the conjunct tab and making a nice pyridomy, nasally and temporally. I don't worry too much about bleeding. And then just the calipers and a little BSS for the cornea. I'll take the calipers, I'll mark them and I'll set them. So I go the four millimeters. So the first question is, how far back do you go? Well, a lot of the articles and stuff you see in the journals say three. And what I found with three is one, um, it works and it's supposed to be equivalent of in the bag, right? Calculations, which is nice. But the problem with three is sometimes the haptics of the lens implant or the sutures are rubbing against the iris. A you tip there? Yep, sure do. So we measure four millimeters back. So I use an extra millimeter, which I have found to work really well. Then we're gonna go to two here. That didn't look right to me. Always make sure it makes sense. I thought I had it at two and I did not. And so we're gonna measure two millimeters to each side of that metal mark. So I got potentially a sclerotomy incisions right there. We're gonna confirm that they're four millimeters back. Again, four to me is really key. Having had troubles with recurrent CME. I'll take a trocar and a cannula here. And we're gonna put this one in.
and we're going to put make this one while we're here. That's also at four. It's nice. And they're about four apart, see? So we'll just make that incision. And I'm going to mark that one. Sometimes it's tough to find later. You got the blue pen. We're going to try and mark it at the blood. You can cauterize here. It's no harm. I just prefer not to if I can get away with that. I just mark it so I can find it later. You got the infusion can. Let's take that in while we're dancing around. No, I mean just the cannula. Yep. And next one. So here we go. And this just want to be away from these two so it's not in the way. And that one I kind of tunnel in. As you probably saw that tunnel, meaning putting in obliquely all the way through. This can always be your first cannula sometimes. I don't worry about it too much unless it's a prior protractomized eye. And now we're going to try and get ourselves directly across. I don't use a trocar marker. You know, it's just, an, just another instrument. We do have those here, but I never found it really useful. The eyeball test here in terms of symmetry it works pretty well. I know we were right there. I want to be directly across. And um, four millimeters again, about right there. And we'll confirm it with our eyes before we place the sutures. You know, just again, to make sure things are about where we want them. That's the first mark. I'm going to make the, the two millimeter one. I rotate this, the calipers a little anterior because we know the eye is curving. I try to match that curve. So I end up at four millimeters on all of these. Now I'm going to recheck with my caliper here that this is for, it's a little back, I'm gonna go right there. You got the cannula there? Yep. So we're just gonna go right in front of that one. And then we're gonna come over here and see the four right there. And that's about right, you like that one. And you got the marker again. So once we have all the incisions in, before we throw any sutures at this, this guy, we wanna make sure that everything looks about symmetrical. So if you go like this real quick, take a look at the uh, how the eye is set up. You got these two across from each other, these two right here and right here across from each other, and that passes the eyeball test. You know, it's pretty much right on without getting too um, measurement obsessed. Okay, we're gonna start our vitrectomy here we're using a um, like a microscope with a eyeball's wide field visualization system. Dork vitrectomy set up in EVA. And we're going to do the vitrectomy first. So things to get in trouble with are pulling out these lens implants when they're wrapped in vitreous and they're about to can tear. Then, of course, you get a detachment right then or a few days later. Very disappointing. So if we can get the vitreous out of the eye, and you can see that lens implant moving because it's entangled in that vitreous. So we want to get the vitreous out first so that we can do this surgery safely. And that includes even a vitreous separation, ideally. So and I'm not really worried about the lens implant falling here. I want to make sure it's not entangled. That's more important. If it falls, then I know it's free of entanglement. And we're going to try and make sure there's no vitreous Remaining back here, typically there is not, but here there is. There's a vitreous, uh, there's still, the vitreous is still attached. So I'm using the aspiration on the cutter to pull the, the weiss ring more or less off the disc, try to engage it, hook it with the retractor. You can maybe just start to see the shadow coming up there. This is a tougher view, I think, for the camera. You can see the shadow of the vitreous there, and it's stripping out quite nicely. And there you can see the white screen came up. The advantage there is now I know I got the vitreous 
that's not going to get snarled up in sutures or lens removal or lens insertion and tying, etc. So I just feel much more comfortable in an eye that has a complete, uh, what I call a complete protractor. And you can see the lens implant shaking and moving again because of those vitreous attachments. That's why you don't want to just grab it and pull it. And uh, it still hasn't fallen yet, but I know there's quite a bit of anterior capsule in this particular case, but I'm working my way around. And the peripheral retina. I do have the cutter pointed, I wouldn't say directly at the retina, but nor do I have it pointed at the middle of the eye. It's kind of sideways, just to engage some of that peripheral retinal skirt. These 25 gauge cutters, do such a nice job of not um, pulling so hard to tear the retina, even when the ports face towards the retina. The 20 gauge cutters, that was a much bigger risk um, because they would grab more vitreous per bite. We're gonna switch hands here. We're fine, you don't have to move it. This is gonna always, I always start my vitrectomy with the temporal hand. Um, I always come back over to the other side because the vitreous can be a little more difficult to reach on the side you're on. So I come across, again, this is a pseudophagic guy. This would be much more difficult in a phagic guy. Don't want to bump the lens. But um, as you can see, we're just kind of making sure all that vitreous is out of our way, which gives us a much better shot of doing this without a complication. We will check for those complications, of course. Whoops. Let's get that over there. Give us a splash on the cornea there. And who has a Q-tip for all that? Team. Just kind of grab some of this out of there. It's Halloween, so this kind of fits. A little extra. There we go. So, give me a splash in the corner again. Take some of that off. There you go. Now, this is not good capsule in terms of like trying to do a capsule support. If anything, I'll try and remove it and get out the rest of the cataract at the same time. There's a little residual cortex there. You can see us pulling out this residual cortex, which I don't like to leave either, because in the end of the day, it, it's very inflammatory. You know, so if we can get that out. And you saw the lens implant drop back there. You got another Q-tip there for me? What you want to be careful of here is... Um, making sure you have, maybe we can get it on aspiration, our vacuum mic. So we're gonna change the settings on the machine to pull a little stronger. Thanks. What you're gonna do is when you grab the iris like that, is you wanna stop and Make sure you don't have the cutter on because you don't want to make extra PIs, you know. Sometimes we can see it a little bit better like this. Let's put the eyeballs in. 
because at this point we're just kind of making uh, blind passes at. Yep, thanks. So just trimming up the vitreous a little bit. And I can just make out some lens capsule here. I'm gonna have Mike maybe turn up the aspiration there. I don't wanna to get too crazy with it. Because again, when you're pooling, Gonna turn it up a little bit for me, Mike. Make it a little bit shorter so I got a bigger. So I'm struggling here a little bit on the capsule removal. The other choice is to grab a forcep and get it out that way, which we could do too, but I think we got it just about here. I keep thinking it's going to release and it doesn't, but you pick up the eyeball set for me. Got a force up there, a super grip. So I'll show you the other way to grab this capsule remnant out. Sometimes we'll just use the retinal force up and grasp it. If we can find it. I kind of lost sight of it. Can I have the retractor back? This would be a part of the case you could let go, but I generally prefer to have all the remnants out. And we're just working that around. And you have the force up again. Nice thing about the force up is you can pull it right out through the sclerotomy site. Like so. As we went wipe there. Have the cutter again. Very elastic and it's working its way out. There we go. And you just grab it and take it out. Now we're clean all the way around and the advantage, you put that back down for me, well, is that there's no cortical material left in the eye to be post-operatively inflammatory. That won't interfere with the sutures much at all. A little lens fragment there, a lens capsule piece. And now is as good a time as any to take a look around the eye. Well, we'll do it after we pull the lens up, I guess. We'll make our um, corneal incision next. And there's the lens implant. Just checking the peripheral vitreous again, and we're in good shape. That lens implant will not hurt the macula lying down there vibrating around a little bit. So we're good there. Okay, now we'll pick up the eyeballs, make our corneal incision for 
explantation of the uh, IOL. So we're going to put make this a biplanar wound. We're in the corneal stroma there. And then we're going to go dimple it and push it straight in. These are things my cataract surgeon friends taught me. I do not have the expertise on corneal wound creation. They do. I tend to always use a suture for that reason. Take some viscoelastic while we're here. I do like to use viscoelastic for corneal protection. And then what we're going to do, I need a side port incision. Yep. We're going to use a side port incision, 15 degree blade. So we can put another instrument in the eye there. Like that one to bleed a little bit so I can find it later. And so what we're going to do is grab this lens implant. Different ways to grab a lens implant. You know, there's four steps, of course. Um, I find the retractor to be quite adequate and quite safe. Just under aspiration. Views a little wonky here because of the um yeah, right, because of the because the viscoelastic. So we just grab it like so. I don't care which orientation it comes up. You can pick that up, yep. Now I'm going to take a pair of forceps. Oh, so we lost it. Let's pick it up again. So that's okay, and that's very common. What you want to do is just, if we have to, we can always use forceps. Like I said, but I usually find it not necessary. Okay, pick that up. No, nope, don't have it. Let's take one more shot at it. And then we'll go to the forceps. Just depends on the edge of the IOL. Can you focus that for me? There we go. Okay. And splash the corny when you get a moment. So you can see I'm just holding the lens there. And we're going to use these forceps through our little side port incision to grab it. There you go. Now we let go of the aspiration. And we've got the lens purchased with the forceps. Now I'm going to bisect it with some intraocular scissors. These are MST forceps and scissors. And there's just two of them here. And we're going to, once the scissors grab it, you can, we perch it, you know, I can hand it to myself like that and get, grab it even better. So what I'm going to try and do is just cut it right down the middle, just behind the iris like this. And that usually works pretty well. And then we're going to, you can see about how far I cut. Do you have that McPherson forceps? So you can see how I cut it. I don't get too particular about which side I'm pulling on or whatever. This one's going to work out nice because the way the haptic is situated there. And you kind of just stretch and it follows itself out like so. So that's our lens implant right there. See how we cut it? Kind of like Pac-Man, that's the Pac-Man thing they talk about, you know. So, and it's like a gummy type material. Do you have a protector there again? I see a little more cortex hanging out. We're going to grab that. Oh, that's probably just iris. Yeah. A little iris pigment, you know, pigment epithelium. There is some, definitely some transillumination type impacts. So we're going to get the next lens implant situated here and ready to go. We're going to do that right here in my clean little field. 
Yep. I'll take the lid off myself. So this is our Acrios lens. You get the McPherson's again. And then load the Gore-Tex into a, um, a Bonacalta. So we take out the Acrios and thank you. The way it goes in the eye, these lenses are um, have a convexity to them, right? So we want the when it you know ain't going backwards, so it's kind of convexing this way. And other thing to know is that this two of the haptics are notched, and the one that's notched right here is the upper right. I like to put my sutures in from the top and come back up. The point being, I think it makes a little better chance of not rubbing up against the back of the iris. And that's one side. They're going to reload my Gore-Tex or the other side. Thank you. I'm going to do the same thing here. Because Gore-Tex is a very forgiving suture. You can do quite a bit with it. Untie the knot, move the knot, etc. Someone did ask the question, can you use this suture to save a Gore-Tex lens that's already in the eye? The answer is yes, we have done that. Um, now we're going to pre-place a couple of the sutures. Pick them as T first. There you go. Let me just hand this off. Okay, and I'll take the super grip forceps there. Yep and a wipe right here by the scrotomy site. I think it's right there, you got a Q-tip. This is where it kind of come over wipe, it just wiped up a little, a little bit more. And I think it's right there, right? Helps to have a yep, good assistant. Other people is a little small, but that shouldn't bother us too much at this point in the case. That's from the trauma of pulling out the other lens. And there's a little handshake, and this one comes through. We're all set. That's one side. On occasion, when you get to the nasal side like this, he's going to show us that one. Hey, go ahead. You can come off. I'm in. On occasion, it's a little tough to get the uh, forcep in the right angle, you can bend these forceps. They're disposable. But I can see this one pretty well, I think. Make sure we're not crisscrossed anywhere and we're not. And there we go. That doesn't have to be too exact. I guess a little distorted, which blows the optics when it's that deep. But we're fine. So now we're going to fold the lens implant. I think some more viscoelastic while we're at this stage. So the visco came out, you know, with the lens coming out. I like to, again, always be considerate of the cornea and try and not have uh, as much protection there as we can. Yep. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So this is a lens folder, picks it up like so. We're gonna make it fold the other direction, tackle this lens like so. And we're gonna make sure we pull up on these inferior sites as we go. You get the McPherson there again for me. And so what we're doing is keeping those sutures a little tight compared to the video. There we go, in the eye. They're pulling up on the sutures, I'm releasing, and that saves the tangling. So now if I have a, um, now you can see the one haptic still in the anterior chamber. I'm just gonna push that back with the super grip there. Yeah, just to get the lens completely into the posterior segment. So I'm gonna grab the suture here to make sure I have slack. And I'm just gonna dunk the lens behind the iris and let go of that suture too. I'm gonna to get a little more suture in the eye just so, it's so it, there's no tension there. Push the lens back. There we go. 
Okay, the McPherson's. I don't know that one. You got it. MSTs? I'm sorry. So we're going to grab the other end of that suture and thread it where it belongs. And again, we want to try and keep everything just like it's supposed to go. There we go. I'm good. And again, you want to, if the lens implants a little further back, a little easier. So it gives you room to stay on top. Part of the reason I like the sutures being on top when I place them is that I can work above the lens to make sure nothing's getting tangled. One of the problems we ran into this procedure when I was first learning it, right? I didn't create this. Many others before me did all that. I take your head over a little bit. Now you can see my forceps are above the lens implant. Oh no, they're not, they're behind. That's no good. I'm gonna bend that forcep right now, which I was, I was showing you guys or talking about earlier. So I'm just gonna take this forcep, get a little bend here on the shaft. I mean, I guess there's some risk you could break it, of course but for the most part, very well tolerated. That makes a huge help working on the nasal side. These are the types of things you don't get to see in an edited video. Just trying to get my force up, up above. Now I'm above the lens implant. So again, you don't want to be twisting. You got to keep your orientation correct. Look how much easier that is now with the bent forcep to work in that plane. Okay. Now we'll take the, the Bonacalta forceps. We're going to pull the cannulas because we don't want those. I'm just going to keep my finger down right here and just pull this out. And Harrison's going to put his finger there. We're going to pull this out. And everything that's gone wrong or could go wrong has gone wrong, including one time we didn't have our finger down tight enough and pulled the suture right out of the eye. So, and Mike's laughing because that was him. <laughs> so, <laughs> can you cut these about an inch off just to get rid of the excess? We're going to cut that right there. There you go. And the same on the other side. Hmm. Just cut it right there. It's fine. Yeah. And so what we're looking at now, again, we want to make sure everything's kind of lined up. You could still replace these sutures in different locations or clock hours if you want it. But you can see how well that lens implant centers up. And these look pretty darn symmetrical. So we're in pretty good shape. You come over here, you can see the suture right there. Going to the temporal haptics, we pull it over nasally or pull it temporally. You can see the nasal ones are like that too. No twists, no wrapping around the haptics. Took me a while to figure out that if we took out some of the slack as we were putting the lens in the eye, it saved a lot of wrapping around the haptics. So simple things like that can make quite a difference. You see me going back and forth. I'm trying to center the lens to figure out exactly where we need to be because the pupils smaller you can't see the edge of the optics but about right there we're pretty good let me take check another look at that there we go and so i'm going to start over here a little bit because this knot always when you cinch this knot down you're always going to pull a little bit to the side i'm going to use another instrument besides my bonacalta here one two three what do you got? Yeah, it work. Should work. See how it moves over? That's what I don't. So you don't want to just tie the knot down and think that. You want to always leave my there. And 
and to play with this knot a little bit so that you know you're not too tight. I like to leave these loose, if anything, not tight, because you don't want to put stress on the optic. Um, if you put stress on the optic, short it, then you get all kinds of optical aberrations and nobody's happy. So you want the lens to kind of be suspended, not tied. Again, these are all things we learned as we I'm not going to put it down quite yet because you saw the lens implant jump. So we're going to make sure we're in a good spot again because it's on my finger here. There we go. Just cut this off bar right here. This piece is giving us a little trouble. Don't no, no, we down here? Yep. There we go. Just cut another side because it was getting wrapped around other stuff, including my finger. And there we go. Just making sure we're well centered. And if we're not, like I said, you can always actually untie these knots. The Gore-Tex is so forgiving. And I've done that a few times where things weren't quite centered up like I thought they would be. And so we put this knot down. And now before we cut that, we'll tie this one. Just a three one one knot. And you can see that come across there very nicely before you and before I tie, I don't want anything tight. I just want it suspended. The lens won't move, it won't shake in the eye, no, no optical problems like that. Looks pretty well centered. I'm just going to put that one down. He's going to cut that. You can leave little tails on these. There you go. Now we're going to cut the other side. Again, the tails are fine. Now we're going to bury the knot in the wound. These knots, this cortex is very well tolerated in the eye. We just got to there you go. We just rotate it in the eye like so. The Gore-Tex is very well tolerated there. So you see how it's going to look when we cover it up with the conjunctiva. Now we'll take a look at our wounds and see how they're leaking and put some uh, sutures over those. And you can see that suture is a little bit loose like that, and that's perfect. We do not need it tight. But you can see this one's leaking. The tip, typically, the working scrimmies are always leaking. So 7.0 and a 0.12. And I did orientate this in a way that we can, um, you know, can it's possible, it is possible to um, cut the Gore-Tex with the Vicryl. I've done that too, with the Vicryl needle. I try to avoid passing in that direction if I can. Let's we'll do a little compression suture here. That one's below the Gore-Tex, right? And now this one will go above the Gore-Tex. And we we'll get that little knot out of there. And we just tie this down. 
Um, typically, the other spermicides sites kind of usually are closed on their own, uh, where we're now didn't have the cannulas. I've tried this with 27 gauge just for this reason to avoid these sutures, but it still had a, a leak at the working site. So got a Q-tip there for me. Here's it, and you can drive that site and show them whether we got a watertight closure or not. I think we do. Yeah, so that looks good. Can you tap this one down here? Yeah, we'll come back to it. It may be leaking a touch. We'll come back to it. It may close up on its own yet. This wound... Oriented this way, I'm going to sew it up this way. And again, I think it's very unlikely to hit the Gore-Tex. If anything, I just went deep to it. You can come off there again, so it just rotates a little less. There you go. I should be able to rotate the eye up. I just grabbed the wound myself. Get the bicro here lined up the right way. There we go. You can push the conch back there. There you go. Good. Pinch that down. They've even seen these wounds leak some after surgery with a little bit of hypotony. Well, I can only recall one case that ever came back, um, actually. Let's see here. Got a Q-tip. And the bleeding stopped nicely, by the way, so we're just going to wipe this blood out so the field's a little cleaner. Got another Q-tip there. There we go. We're going to check the wounds here. That one's dry down there, a little bit of blood coming up, but that's you know, just from the wound, but no, no fluid. Over here, also dry, very good. You got some BSS for the um, cornea. We'll put the conjunctiva up. We're gonna put the corneal wound suture in and we're all set. And so you got the uh, tenno. Yeah, eh, this is the point when this will work. I do tend to, um, I'll check the wound here a little bit. So this wound's actually watertight, but again, I don't trust my wounds like I would some of the cataract surgeons. I'm not making these that often. I tend to always throw the stitch, feeling that I'm a little safer um, in terms of lowering my infection chances. We grasp that where I'm a little more comfortable. The one ten O suture that typically take this out. Um, you can cut it here. And a scissors and a couple of tires. Yeah, right in there somewhere. That's fine. And um, typically to cut the suture out and remove it about week three after surgery or so. Sometimes this suture is a little tight or whatever my refractive errors and but whatever works for you. Or if you're confident in your wound, maybe you won't even bother putting this suture little compression, lock it.
by my least favorite part of the case. You got some BSS with the cornea? We're going to cut this. Finally, let me see what I got here. Yeah, we broke it. That's fine. We'll put another one in. That was a little loose anyhow. So we're taking the 10-0 back. I'm going to make this wound again. I'll just close this, this again. And this time what we're going to do, by the way, is we're going to also nice bite there, kind of that in two steps. We're going to clamp the infusion. So I'm not tying against the intract, the pressure of the uh, retractomy system. There you go. I'm going to cut this down here again. So if you sometimes if you're having trouble suturing, especially tenno sutures, ever in a retinal surgery, you have to remember that the big difference is we're pressurizing the eye and you're tying against that little tougher to keep the suture tight while you're putting it down. So you just turn it off so the eye can soften a little bit or just be better at suturing than I am, which is quite possible. This is where it helps to have the fellow jump in and do it. They're a little more familiar with corneal wounds than I am. Oh, I did that again. I kind of snapped it off. But I think we're okay. Yeah. Now it's loose again. Put the infusion on. Let's see if it tightens up. That's too loose. So sometimes the smallest parts of the case can give you a little bit of trouble, but you just got to get it right. This is obviously not the critical part of the case. I clamp it up. So what I did at both times in my tying of the knot, I had it locked. You put the infusion on for just a moment. Okay, now turn it off again. So our third try here, can you cut this for me? And then the tires. don't have to lock that. I think that's half my problem. There we go. And we'll cut this again. Try and rotate the knot into the eye. You can go on. It doesn't have to be rotated either. It can be. Now we're getting held up there. We're just going to let that go. You have the 7 0. Let's take this clot out. Let me show you the. Um, Here you like the, these are the sutures I care more about actually. You want to make sure the bike of conjuring type is well up over your Gore-Tex. You don't want the Gore-Tex being exposed while it heals. 
or healing up on top of the conjuring taiva just because that's the infection risk. This is um, too long. Just cut it right there, way down. Yep. And so we want to make sure that we got the uh, conjuring taiva up to the point where it's not going to recede and create a problem uh, in terms of exposing the suture, long-term infection risk here. I've not had a patient come back yet with a uh, late infection, end up the mitis or something. I've had a couple patients over the years, but we went back to cover the suture though, usually because they have multiple operations beforehand, uh, spiral buckles or something, and the conjuring type is just not in good shape with this part of the case. I would not expect this one to be a problem. They're going to dry that blood there, just rolled over more, get this whole thing. Should all stay. So that see that gap there? We don't want that. So we're going to always put the extra suture and the conjuring type on these cases. And around there, yeah. So that gets us where we need to be on the nasal side, which is always a little more difficult. Again, you can see where this is at. You see the Gore-Tex under the conjunctiva there. There we go. So a couple of things. One is when you're doing this case, you have to have the lens implant that's already in the eye. You know, so you can either do a conversion and calculate what this acrial's power should be, um, or you can have the patient remeasured, you know, with uh, biometry. So uh, A scan, uh, IOL mast, or whatever your preference is. This one we'll probably put in after we pull the cannula there. A little long. See if you can trim that for me. You got a Q tip, Mike? And so we're just gonna take a look over here real quick. See the conjunctiva is up to the limbus, little subconjunctoma, not a problem. Everything's watertight. And then we're gonna pull out this one to place the last suture. Then this one, we can press on the wound right there again, on the top of the wound to make sure that leak is closed. I'm not looking to close that up if I don't have to. Eyes well pressurized. And again, I'm always going to place the extra suture to keep the cortex covered, whereas a normal case, you may not bother, meaning for some reason you cut the conj down or whatever. Here, you're always better off, even if it just holds for a few days. There you go. Okay, squirt us all down. You got a little BSS for the uh, reconstitute the eye. And so here's that one suture, clearly visible, well covered. The eye is just a little soft. How about a needle, 30 gauge? Very little, um, look at the broken tenos, very little BSS to put in the eye there. We're nice and firm, holding pressure very well. So that's it. So that's our case. 
and the suture is a little oblique here, but it's only it's coming out. It doesn't. It's not going to affect us. And we'll get that out in a couple of weeks. So that's the conclusion of lens removal and suturing of a acrios four point fixation with Gore-Tex. Let me finish this up because there's the four point fixation. Um, excellent cosmetic functional results. Let's see here. It's not moving. Let's see this one move it. There we go. So Gore-Tex can be two millimeters from the limbus. Three millimeters is quote in the bag calculation. I use four as I mentioned during the talk. So the lens is I'm bumping into the back of the iris. Uh, dislocated IOL surgical cases in our practice. We looked at this number recently. Um, Harrison's pulling together a report with some other people. We have about 250 cases over the last five years. And you know, what's been shifting is if you go back even further, the number that were Acrios Gore-Tex were maybe 5% in 2015, approaching 90% in 2023 for this particular technique. The other 10% are really uh, the, the Yamani, because I have one partner who's pretty experienced at that and very comfortable, and the other ones are ACI Wells. Um, and as a percentage, uh, you know, Without suturing, that's what I was just talking about, the 5% ACI wells this year. So it's becoming a more common referral practice um, for our group doing quite a few of these. The treatment options can be tailored to the individual patients. Obviously, no suture or sterile fixation is ideal in places where there's sulcus support. Uh, this has certainly been gaining popularity in our group, um, but longer term follow up of this technique is always needed to see how things play out over, you know, even 10 or 20 years to really see what's going on. And so I'll go back to the um, questions. Uh, case is somewhat similar. We have a lens implant that I think is more displaced or subluxed more than totally dislocated. And we're going to look at whether we have to take that out and put it in a three piece in the sulcus or whether that's going to be a suture dial. Well, also, we always kind of prepare for both. So we so we uh, have the measurements for the acrios, but I also often just get the measurements for an, um, a three-piece sulcus lens like an Alcon MA60AC is the most common one we use here for uh, sulcus placement. So a few questions. Um, how do you remove lenses that are calcified or aren't able to cut in half easily? Well, in the ones that are from Alex Miller, so my, my son I think is a resident over at Missouri and uh, on the retina service. So very good question. You know, the... Um, Ones that can't be cut, which are the TMMA ones, the old ones, we just open the wound up to six millimeters. Uh, I don't like doing that as much because now you got a big corneal wound and it's good to know ahead of time because you can break the scissors trying to cut these hard plastic lenses. Um, so it basically comes down to the plastic lenses. If they're calcified, uh, I've never had a lens so calcified we couldn't cut it. I've had some rings ring cataracts like around the edge in the bag with a lot of calcium. And those will not come out through the protractor. You know, they bounce off like little pebbles. You end up trying to bring those to the anterior chamber and pulling them out that way, flushing them out. Um, another question was, why was the suture buried in the wound? Uh, the reason we do that is because we're afraid that if the knot is above the sclera, that it will rub through the conjunct hive with that type of irritation. I'm not so sure that's likely. Actually, Gore-Tex is so pliable and not stiff that you could compress it with the suture, with the suture, the needle holders, and it would almost flatten out like a pancake. So I'm not, if you can't rotate it in, which can be a bit of a trick sometimes, I've seen people struggle with that. Um, if you have to leave it on the surface, just compress it flat with the needle driver and uh, you'll probably be fine. If you don't have Gore-Tex available, um, another suture that you can probably use is uh, 9 or 8 -0 proline. That was what we used to use. The prolines will, you know, they're very thin and they can cheese wire. So a, a thin suture can cut through tissue under tension. But as long as you leave it loose enough, it should not cheese wire through these haptics or through the sclera. So I do think 8 or 9 -0 proline could be could suffice, or nylon for that matter. Uh, do you always suture the sclerotomy where you bury the cortex? I'd say 95% of the time, I am stuck throwing those vicrols there, the suture, those scrotum sites closed or where I bury the knot. Um, how often do you find CME? How do you manage that? So CME found that to be a problem in the early going. Um, 
with this procedure, it seemed like, oh my gosh, up to a third or even half of the patients were getting recalcitrant CME. We could treat it with steroids and it would go away, but it always came back. And when I was looking at these eyes more closely, I was seeing a lot of transillumination defects right in the location of the haptics. And so these haptics do tend to curve or bend a little bit under the tension of those sutures. And you're just right behind the iris. And I think the chafing up there was contributing to the CME. The CME has been much less of a problem at four millimeters back than three. And uh, that's what's working for me over the last couple of years. Um, next question. Uh, am I using a 27 gauge trocar? No, I'm using 25. I have a tried 27s to get away from suturing the sclerotomy sites, and I still had the suture, so I quickly went back to 25. But I do think, I do think the 27s instinctive, you know, just your instincts would be the wounds are going to be tighter, they'll close. So I do want to um, go back and try that some more with 27 gauge. Do I think it worked with 23? I do think it can work. You just got to sew the wound for sure. What are your concerns regarding the hydrophilic material opacifying later, especially in complicated eyes? So the issue with acryos is uh, that type of material can opacify, especially with intraocular gas. I've seen exactly one case of that. That was my own patient where I sutured in the lens years ago and they came back and detached several years later in the same eye. And uh, the lens that opacified had to go back and cut it out and replace it. So it's made for extra steps. It's not that big a concern, I guess. Like it's, it's such a rare event um, I'm not sure on what the opacification rate is. I have plenty of other patients that we've done retinal surgery for with acryos or these types of material lenses, and they don't opacify. So I think the the risk of it is small enough that I'm not at all frightened off and want to use other lenses or other material. I think this one goes in so well with four-point fixation. The downside being opacification, if you get intraocular gas, is like, you know, you're starting to treat complications that are very unlikely to happen as opposed to doing what can work best for you in a case. Uh, the next question there is, what size of the suture do you use for corneal stitches? Makes it break easy, can use a figure of H. You can do anything to close those corneal wounds. That's definitely not my um, forte. I would tell you that you saw me break two and the third one was still a little bit oblong or, you know, uh, uh, not not radial. It's a temporary suture. Whatever works for you is fine. Um, you don't have to uh, bury the knot. It's just the typical teaching is to bury the knot for comfort. But with the conjunctiva being boggy and that being tenno suture, the knot on the surface for a couple of weeks won't matter. Uh, can we expect can we expect the ELP or a spherical equivalence in the post op? Right. So if you get the IOL calculations, I know the patient's refraction with the old lens. If they have their implant card and you can figure out what the old A constant was and do the mathematical conversion. For the most part, these refractions come in pretty much about what we want. When we're doing IOL calculations or, uh, or biometry, uh, we kind of just go for in the bag placement. So the machine's already set up that way and it's pretty close. I do always warn the patients, um, you're going to have a refractive correction, glasses will be changed. Another question is sometimes comes up what about? Um, Torque lenses and multifocal lenses. And my answer there would be is we don't get that fancy here. At this point, you have a dislocated IOL and we're not trying to reposition torque lenses or multifocal uh, lenses. The torque lenses I did try once or twice and it's a matter of getting that lens to fixate in a way by punching a hole in it. But not that, um, not that straightforward. There are some surgeons punching holes in the... Uh, and the, where the haptic joins the IOL and stringing a suture and getting the lens in the right axis. I've not found that to be uh, very reproducible or, or easy to learn, I will say. And so for the most part, I don't chase after um, the cylinder in these cases. What was the band of the secondary IOL? This was a Bausch and Loam, yeah, Bausch and Loam Acrios AO60. Oh, here we go. It's one of these. So there you go. Uh, this is what it looks like in the box. And the numbers are like so, you know. Whoops, upside down. So, you know, we just, we don't, 
we actually do enough of these that we keep a whole consignment of all the powers here. Um, you can always order these one off. I actually work at Children's Hospital too in uh, Akron doing retinal surgery. And we've actually placed this exact same lens in some pediatric patients um, ages uh, 10, eight, and maybe as low as a six-year-old now for whatever reason cannot tolerate uh, a fake contact lens and needed a lens implant. And uh, this has worked very well for them too. Um, does this procedure have advantage over the other types of cataract surgery? I think the best cataract surgery is always one without complications. Fake emulsification or however you do your procedure and in the bag placement is ideal, not in the bag in the socket. I think both of those are better than suturing or skull fixating anything. Uh, always would rather not have to do this type of procedure and go with one that um, is the standard cataract procedure of your region. Uh, the comparison of visual oct Outcomes and centration of vortex versus the Yamani uh, technique. That's a very good question. So, this lens, you can definitely play with the centration back and forth, and also that don't have any tilt. Yamanis, I've seen some of those tilt, right? They get a little like this or something, which I know can throw off optics. But it's a big, it's a big lens implant. I think it centers really well. I do not know of any literature or studies having been done to compare those outcomes. We are gonna be looking at that probably this year and next year with some other groups in the country to kind of get the uh, outcomes, count complications, outcomes, and even refractive outcomes for these cases. Um, have you tried explaining the ILL via a well-constructed scleral tunnel? Yes, I have done that uh, prior. And the problem with the scleral tunnels is oftentimes these surgeries are old enough that the sclera was already incised and sutured together uh, 20 years ago, and it's very, very thin. And so they make a second scleral tunnel in the same location. It's difficult. You end up either being too shallow or too deep. You enter too deep. You enter the anterior chamber too deep and the iris is prolapsing. If you're too shallow, you have buttonholes in the uh, scleral uh, roof there. So I prefer at this point just to go up into the cornea. And if it's small, I think we do fine. And even at six millimeters, you can suit you that well enough to eliminate big refractive shifts. Um, if a retractive machine is not available, can I do secondary eye implantation without retracting me? You certainly can. If you don't have access to a retractive and the lens implant somewhere in the iris plane area, I think you can very cautiously, you know, manipulate it where you could grab that lens implant and do all a scissor retracting as you're explaining it to try and keep the vitreous from trailing you out of the eye. Certainly your risk is higher for retinal tearing and detachment, but you can do that. Uh, does this type of IOL have any, IOL intraocular lens implant have any side effect? But what everyone knows about is opacification with intraocular gas, which we covered earlier, which I think is so rare and my own personal experience, I don't even recall what the numbers are, percentages, but so rare, I just don't see it as much of an issue. And um, what is your point of view about multifocals and trifocals in normal cases? Multifocals, interestingly, I have family members with multifocal IOLs and they love it. So these are people who are healthy in their mid sixties and they love the multifocal ability. A lot of my patients are elderly with macular degeneration or macular puckers or prior macular holes. And I think there it's not a good choice. So I think if your retina is really healthy and you're maybe towards the younger side of cataract surgery, and my bias is the multifocals are probably very, very nice. If you're an older patient with any retinal compromise or just older in general, and you may be frustrated by the lack of contrast, uh, you may want to stay away from the multifocals. And uh, now the last question here is what would be the preferred, uh, what will be the preferred to this procedure to laser, please? I'm not exactly sure what you mean, but uh, you know, if we had the laser or anything, it's looking around for retinal tears under spell depression and making sure we don't have a problem. Okay, well, that's kind of the end of the open questions and we're prepping the next patient now, uh, it's actually already been 
like an hour and a half. So we're probably just going to cut it here for the program. So uh, you saw the bigger case for sure. And we'll see how this one goes. But thank you for joining us here on CyberSite. Uh, appreciate everyone participating and asking the questions. And I uh, look forward to doing uh, more presentations in the future. Have a great day.